In this video, we'll see how to deal with pulleys that actually have mass. So, the idea is that we are going to start with, well, let's set up our tools. Here's our pulley. See if that'll turn into a circle. Very good. There's the center. And we are going to be, oh, let's see if I can't draw straighter lines these days. We're going to see if we can't uh, draw a straight line there and have a mass hanging from that pulley. So there's my straight line. Here is a mass that's hanging from the pulley. And let's label some things. So uh, for example, let's call this M1 for mass 1. The pulley has a mass M2. It has a radius from there to there. Let's call that R. There's sort of an R. Um, and of course, when we deal with the system, we need to consider both rotational motion and linear motion. So the pulley itself is fixed. It rotates without friction. And the mass, M1, falls. Uh, now, it's going to fall somewhat slower than gravity because it's held up, held up by this pulley. And the pulley takes a little while to get rolling here. Uh, so we need to account for that. A free body diagram of that pulley would look something like this. We would uh, say that there is some tension that holds it up, label it T, and there is some weight force, W, equal to M1G that pulls it down. Uh, and of course, if it's moving downward uh, and it is not moving with fixed velocity, uh, we have to apply Newton's second law and it's no longer statics. So considering this portion of the system, we would write the sum of the forces, we'll write it as a vector, is equal to, well, M1A, that's the only mass that's moving in the system, it's moving in the negative y direction, and that's going to equal our tension force, which pulls upward as a positive y hat, uh, and we will subtract, well, let's do an addition and, and uh, account for the sign in the unit vector, and M1G, the weight force, pulls downward. So uh, that's our equation of, uh, of motion for this particular mass, or, and it goes with our free body diagram. When we start eliminating the unit vectors, we can pull the signs out of things, and then we end up getting negative M1A equals the tension minus M1G. Or if we want an expression for the tension, which we're going to see is actually very useful, we can write that the tension is equal to m1 times the quantity g minus a. And what I've done there is I factored, since there's an m1 in that term and in that term, I factored it out. Now, why why is m I'm sorry why is the tension such an important quantity? Because it's really balanced uh, here. There's really a tension force that's acting downward, and it is one and the same tension force that is pulling the mass upward, um, although the mass moves down. So uh, that tension force is what's going to be used when we consider this portion of the system. And here we use Newton's second law for torque. So this was Newton's second law for forces. Newton's second law for torque looks like this. The sum of the torques is equal to the principal moment of inertia times alpha. And that, well, if we sum everything up, that will be equal to, well, the only torque that's applied comes from the tension force acting through a moment arm of R. So we would write R times T. And that angle does a right angle. I can write the sine theta. It's really sine of 90 degrees, which will go to 1. And we, if we are to use a unit vector uh, here, the sense of rotation is leftwards. It goes in this direction, counterclockwise. And that means, uh, ultimately, the torque is coming out of the page at us. That torque is in the z direction. So um, uh, by our usual conventions, for, for anyone who's a latecomer, we typically, in this class, have set things up such that our x-axis points there, our y-axis points there, and if we have z-axis, it does point out of the board. 
here's my facsimile of that, and there is the z-axis, and I can put little hats for the unit vectors. All right, so if all of that's true, that means that uh, if I take the magnitudes here, um, this is all that's left, and that can be written as I alpha, oh, let's change tools, I alpha is equal to R times T. And, and this T right down here is where that comes in. Now, before we proceed further, there are a couple of ways that we can proceed with the problem of this, like this, and it depends on what we're being asked for. So what I've done here before actually telling you what, we've, what you're being asked for is I actually set up the equations of motion so you, hopefully you can clearly see the torque portion in blue up here and the force portion down in red. Now, let's put some givens in, and then we're going to grab these equations and, and uh, put them to work. So, let's say the givens are that the uh, angle change, change in angle, change in theta, as the disk rotates, is equal to 5 radians. Let's say that the um, radius of the disk is equal to 1.5 meters, it's a big pulley. Let's say the mass of the disk, M2, is equal to 2.0 kilograms. Let's say the mass, M1, of the object is equal to 4.0 kilograms. Um, and if we're given that much, the question may be, oh, it could be one of several things, but let's say what is the velocity, the linear velocity, let's state it clearly, linear velocity of the falling mass m1 we'll give it a little more space m1 uh, when the change in theta of 5 radians has occurred so that's the problem now so we've got a couple of equations we can use here. Let's let's recycle them. Let's put them all over here. And um, so one of them, let's say equation one, our force equation was t equals m1 g minus a. Okay, excellent. T, uh, equation two is that i, the moment of inertia of that disk, times its angular acceleration, is equal to r times f. R times F, okay, I'm getting rusty. R times T, T being the tension, the very same tension. We can put these two equations together, I hope you can see. Uh, we can substitute equation one into equation two, in which case what we will get is that I times alpha is equal to R M1 G minus A. Now, if you're observant, you'll say, okay, well, we know R, we know M1, we know G. Um, we can get the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia for a disk is something like 1 half MR squared, um, solid disk. But we have two unknowns, that is the angular acceleration and the uh, linear acceleration. We don't know what those are. Is there a way we can relate the two? Well, it turns out that the acceleration of this falling mass here, that M1, is the same as the tangential acceleration of the point on the outer edge of the pulley. So, really, we can write a third equation, we'll write it here, 3, A, I could write, subscript it with a T to show it's tangential, equals A, this A, the acceleration of the mass, and that is equal to R times alpha. So there is an expression that relates the two. Now, as I put all this together, I could choose to substitute for A, or I could choose to substitute for alpha. Since we're looking for a linear velocity, let's substitute for alpha. So alpha is equal to A over R. And now we can put this into, well, I'll go this way, into the equation there, and our next equation is now much simpler. Well, from our viewpoint of solving for one variable. I A over R is equal to R M1 G minus A. 
So one equation, one unknown, it's soluble. Let's beat around the algebra a little bit. So IA over R equals RM1G minus RM1A. We're going to bring this term to the far side. And when we do that, it's negative sign turns to a plus sign. So we have IA over R plus R m1a equals r m1g. Now, I, I see a fractional term here. Sometimes that makes students nervous. So let's, uh, let's do something, uh, and that is let's multiply both sides of this equation by r. So if we multiply both sides of that equation by r, the end result is that the r in the denominator disappears. We have i, there's my i, the moment of inertia, the linear acceleration plus, I'm going to change the order here, I'm going to write m1 r squared a equals m1 r squared g. So we have moment of inertia, which has the same dimensions as the m1 r squared, and we have accelerations, an a, an a, and a g. So that's a nice symmetrical kind of equation to work with. Let's solve for a. It's the unknown, so hopefully it's um, clear that that's what you want to look for. So we do that by factoring it out from both terms on the left side. So a is going to be, uh, so we'll have a times the quantity i plus m1 r squared, and that will equal m1 r squared times g. Or uh, when we divide both sides by this stuff, we have a is equal to m1 r squared g all over all of this, i plus m1 r squared. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. We could get the acceleration, we could plug in the numbers. However, we're not going to do that quite yet. Um, let's go a little bit further. Remember what we're looking for. We are looking for the linear velocity. So it's basically the linear velocity of an object that is falling with a constant acceleration. How do we know it's constant? Well, g isn't changing, at least not in the distances we're dealing with. The mass isn't changing, nor is the radius of the wheel. The moment of inertia of the wheel isn't changing. The mass of the wheel isn't changing, and so on. So that, that's a constant angular acceleration. It's a bit slower than g, as I hope you'll see. Uh, so we have an m1 r squared term in the numerator and in the denominator, but we have a little bit more in the denominator. So it's got to be less than g. So let's... Uh, now figure out how we get the velocity. Well, the equation that comes to mind from linear kinematics is something like this. 2 a y equals v f squared minus v naught squared. If we know, for example, that the disk is not spinning to begin with, that initial velocity goes to zero. So now let's look at this. We have 2 a y and vf squared. We're looking for vf. We got an acceleration. Do we know the distance it falls? Hmm. Well, we've got rotational motion. We have a change in theta. That's basically how far the disk uh, revolved as, or, or, or turned, I should say, as, uh, as the mass fell. So one can really use an arc length formula. So if you remember, Let's say that this is some delta theta. This is obviously not to scale. That is r. This is some length s. The amount of string that unwinds from this length s goes into basically linear drop for the mass. So if we know delta theta, which we do, and we know r, we also ultimately, after we unwind this some number of times, we, maybe we don't want to call it s, maybe we want to call it y. We also know y. So, what we can do, therefore, is we can write vf squared equals 2ay. That's equal to 2a times all 
r delta theta. There's our y, and so vf is equal to the square root of all of this stuff, 2a r delta theta. So, so far so good. So let's, let's make use of some of these equations. The ones that we're going to uh, use in our uh, scratch pad are these. We're going to solve for an acceleration, just so the formula don't get too long. And then having the acceleration, <coughs> we're going to use this equation. So basically, we're going to make use of two equations and then get a final answer. So let's do scratch pad. Come on out. All right, so here's scratch pad. And let's scroll up and see some of our givens here, if I can get to them. Okay. Moving up, all right. So let's say theta equals 5 radians, r equals 1.5 meters. I'm using uh, the double slashes for labels. I'll go m1 equals 4.0 kilograms, m2 equals 2.0 kilograms, g equals 9.8 meters per second per second. And is there anything else I have? I think that about does it. Those are my givens in this case. Um, oh yeah, you know, there's one other thing that we haven't done. Uh, actually, have we done it? No. Uh, and that is uh, calculated the moment of inertia. So we'll actually go ahead and do that on scratch pad. So first of all, this is an extended comment. Calculate the moment of inertia of the disk. So I close that comment with a star slash. So I equals 0.5 times, well, let's see, what are we looking at? We're looking at the mass, mass of the disk is M2. I could in fact label it up here, mass of disk, just to be clear. M1 is the mass of falling weight. Okay, so uh, 0.5 times M2 times R times R. Uh, that's the moment of inertia of a solid disk, and uh, where did I get that? You can get that. Uh, this is the moment of inertia of a solid disk around a principal axis. This is from Wikipedia. There it is. Uh, disk radius R and mass, get, mass M. So I think we're, we're safe on that. And actually, let's get Zornal in the background. There we go. Okay, so that's our moment of inertia. Next, calculate the linear acceleration. So now what I'm going to do is I will use this formula. Let's scooch this over a little bit. So A equals M1 times R times R times G divided by parentheses I plus M1 times R times R. So this is going to be, of course, in meters per second per second. Finally, calculate the velocity. All right, so this is going to look like Vf equals, let's scroll down so we see the exact formula, and in JavaScript we do math dot sqrt math square root 2 times a times r times theta, close parentheses. So now I want to run it. Let's go ahead and run it. So I'll go to execute, run, execute, display. So what did I get? My final result for the linear velocity looks like this. Now that's a whole lot of significant figures. If I want to be a little bit uh, more careful here, what I could do a couple of things. I could put it out as an alert. Um, I could put it as a comment. Um, so out as like an out string equals the answer is, note the quotes, i put a space, uh, VF equals, this is now what's called a concatenation operator, it means that you can add things into the string, VF plus, I'm going to add units, meters per second, close, and now 
the last thing that is calculated or displayed in one of these is what, what you actually see. So I'll do run and display. So all that looks pretty good, but I still have way too many significant figures. As you can see, most of these, so actually this should be a 5.0, um, most of those, all of them have two sig figs. So to deal with that, what I would do is put vf.2 fixed. And that says keep two digits past the decimal point. And let's run this one more time. Execute, run, execute, display. And there it is. Oh, not quite. So here, what we've got, we still have to work. I've got two significant figures past the decimal point, but I want two significant figures, period. So here I am. we got to do it one more time. At least you now know two fixed. So here, having seen that, what we might want to do is do math round zero. That says how many how many uh, significant figures do you want to keep, period, uh, after the decimal point. Uh, let's run it. Whoops. Uh, oh, shoot. Math round. Let's do the right function here. Uh, there's a different method. I'm sorry. Math round. Keep zero figures. One more time. Hopefully I got the syntax right. And I think I did because there's no error. And the answer is 11 meters per second. Okay, so there we have it. Uh, that is a falling disk. I'm also going to do a lecture like this using uh, rotational kinetic energy to get the answer.